Welcome back to the charismatic voice. Peter Gabriel is legendary, but I feel a little bit guilty because I'm not particularly familiar with his voice or music. I think the only song that I'm a little bit familiar with is Sledgehammer, but that is going to change today. We're going to be taking a first time look and listen at the single that launched his solo career, Salisbury Hill. So let's get to it. <laughs> This is very interesting. I, I expected a different voice. I told you I'm very unfamiliar with his work. Um, and there is so much that I hear in common with Phil Collins, which isn't surprising to me um, because they both had genesis in their history and they crossed paths there as well. Um, he has so much clarity in his sound and it just... It's the kind of sound you want to narrate a story. It has the ability to take you down a stream of words and paint a picture. And it's really, it's just beautiful. And it really draws a person in. Uh, I was noticing uh, that I really like their jackets. I think they got some mad jacket style. <laughs> I was digging the trench coats, the long ones for sure. And then he came out with his shorter coat style. And I was like, oh, brave, brave. I um, was really, really digging that. And there's a lot of catchiness um, in the main riff for this song. And there's a combination of, it feels like sentimentality that I hear in the harmonic progression as well. I'm gonna go back to the beginning. <laughs> I wonder if it's hard to do that and play at the same time. Oh, I wonder if he's saying that because the first lyrics are about climbing up on Salisbury Hill. Um, I know that um, this Salisbury Hill was a place that Peter would frequently walk to or jog on in England. Um, so you really get the idea of traveling through something here. Okay, go back to the beginning one more time. <laughs> There's um, something really interesting in the music here where you feel um, the beat doesn't feel completely square. Uh, it does have a subdivision of two, like mm, two and one and two and one and two and that's happening in there. But it doesn't feel, I noticed that there was a feeling of continue or continuing on wanting to sort of tumble over into something new essentially at the end of a certain beat and I felt myself cut off a little bit like I it was something unexpected that kind of came back around and that's because I think the time signature is in 7-4 I'll count it out in a bit Five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is extremely unusual. Extremely, extremely unusual. You hear interesting time signatures in progressive rock bands, but I didn't think that he was particularly progressive rock. I think Genesis might have a little bit of progressiveness to them, but it's not uh, it, it's not like Tool or, or Rush here, right? This feels a little bit more mainstream. To have this kind of time signature is very surprising, but it's very smoothly done at the same time where you can catch on to it. And I think that's partly because they've repeated uh, this kind of hooky feeling and hooky melody. Um, uh, I guess it's a hooky riff, really. They've repeated that over and over in the intro so you don't feel completely thrown off the edge by it. You're getting used to it because of the repetition. Very, very cool. I keep wanting there to be an eight. <laughs> feeling to those. It has a, it feels uplifting in a lot of ways. I like the way his voice has both that depth in it. I, you hear, it feels like some wisdom, right? And then it's got a certain shininess. Uh, that's where that clarity is really coming in, where it feels like it's got the forward focus. Um, not with a lot of nasality though. Um, it sounds like he's got, um, Still quite a bit of spaciousness kind of back here in the vocal tract without going into opera mode. And he's got very little, if any, vibrato I've been hearing. Um, you know, really just keeping it pretty straight and simple and telling the story. I'm gonna keep going along. I liked the boom, boom. Was it boom, boom, boom part? It sounded cool. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Yeah, that part. <laughs> So fascinated by how the phrasing is playing with the 7-4 time signature. He catches it essentially at the end of the 7-4 and he lands his last syllable at the 1 at the beginning of the 7-4 each time. Um, landing that last syllable helps reassert the downbeat um, of the 7-4. The downbeat is usually the first beat in a set of a time signature. So if you have uh, four, four time, you'd have one, two, three, four, and the one is the downbeat there. You know, in this case, we've got seven. So the one is still the downbeat, but we have essentially six other less strong beats. And the first beat is going to be the strongest. That helps us kind of keep orientation within such a strange time signature. Uh, but it, it's remarkable how smoothly they're going into that downbeat each time. And I think it has to do with the phrasing and the fact that he's not starting to sing on the downbeat, but rather ending his singing on the downbeat. It's much more likely that a person would begin a phrase on the downbeat than end the phrase on the downbeat. It's very, very interesting. I like this compositionally a lot. I should cut. 
ooh, that was cool how he said cut. That made sense because the word cut means that things get chopped off and he made cut really short. So just wanted to add to this time signature. I'm gonna count it out still because I think for a lot of people, I don't, I don't know if this would be second nature to count out. Um, you really want to look for one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and say we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, which is very, very, um, it's just so unusual and so cool how they're managing it. He starts singing on the fifth beat every single time in this verse. I think he's on a verse right now. So I'm really, I'm paying such close attention to how they're making such a strange time signature work. you know that this really is totally live and I mean this is live in Athens 1987 right this you wouldn't hear a lot of um subbing over music at this point so the way you heard the change in the mic on boom 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 there he has got remarkably beautiful pitch he really stays centered on that pitch just incredibly well and he really has nice airflow through it all so that his voice is staying super present too. I like this presence and the clarity and the way that he's telling the story as well. Um, really, really clear diction too, right? We get a, a definite idea. And then there's also just a tiny bit of, like just the tiniest bit of gravel that makes his voice sound like it has some more character in it that I think is very cool. Uh, I like this boom, boom, boom part a ton. And I feel very caught up in the story that he's telling now that I'm not just thinking about the really cool time signature and how they're managing to weave it in. Um, I think it's interesting to get this idea of him essentially on a life journey. Um, I He talked about going from day to day, talked about going through a rut at one point, um, about friends not understanding choices. I had read that this song was partly about that struggle and decision to leave Genesis and start a solo career. Um, but you get this idea that uh, he's talking about a really difficult decision, but about the bravery that it took to make that decision and the willingness to just jump off a ledge and take that leap of faith. Like, it's not even faith. It's just take a leap try something. It feels incredibly encouraging and um, very uplifting. So I'm going to go back just a little bit and then keep going. so impressed by how much activity, the bouncing in particular, that can cause your diaphragm to be a little bouncy too. And he has such a smooth sound despite that, right? It's very, very smooth. I don't hear the bouncing affecting the tone at all or the pitch center too, because you got to keep in mind that your larynx can bounce as well. And that might affect the breath pressure that's underneath it, which in turn can affect the pitch. And I hear no, um, no wavering whatsoever. Also, this very attractive uh, sound that he makes where he does a little cry into where here. I've heard it a few times and each time he's done it, I've gone, oh, I like that sound.
it actually uses a shadow vowel before. So he's not seeing where, but where, essentially, and using that, um, it's a vowel that precedes the actual word. There's various vowel combinations like this. Often with the W, though, you don't just go w, you go w. So where? <laughs> happens very quickly. We're gonna listen to it one more time. It's a really good way to make your consonants a little bit more clear by putting this little extra vowel uh, just before certain ones with this OW combination. It's a great example. touched by this it it feels like it feels like you want to go make something of your life when you listen to a song like this i i love this one of the phrases in here today i don't need a replacement meaning i'm going to grasp the day i'm going to go do everything i can with it make it really really worthwhile i love the idea of your heart going boom 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 the way that that interrupts the flow of the music as well with that excitement essentially to live and go live something that is maybe unexpected. Um, <laughs> even talks about that smile. Man, you can really hear it. I liked the way on Smile too, he did a little uh, a little dip in it too. He adds a little air and smile too as he slides down. It makes it sound like he's got a smile on his vocal track while he's singing it. You can hear that little, um, this little sound into his starts a lot on Hayes right there. Uh, I think that must be one of his signature things to me. It sounds, um, it's a really great sound. And so I like that he's leaning into it and doing it a lot. The track that they've got going on the stage, I'm really curious what that track is for. It looks like they've got something cool maybe they use in the show later. Uh, it does provide a very nice grid for where to bounce together too. <laughs> Again, very surprised by how smooth he's keeping the voice with the bouncing. It's definitely a bouncy song. Uh, there was one other thing in there, but I forgot what I was going to say. So I'm just going to go back a little bit because I'm digging the groove. <laughs> oh, I remember what it was now. So... Uh, home, I want to say, is it back home? Maybe it's me home. Let's go, let's do this again. Maybe it's me. So he's alter, altering the vowel up there to make it a little bit easier with that height. So if you just think an E, me home, that sound isn't going to keep that smoothness and warmth that we're hearing in his tone quality. You'll hear a sudden shift. And so he shifts the vowel a little bit to keep it in line, essentially. Uh, it's a very, very smart thing. A lot of really great singers do this where they all 
they'll do vowel modification to keep everything a little more close to each other. You don't want sudden shifts because that can really draw the audience out of the story you're telling. So part of the smoothness in his voice is going to be coming from small vowel modifications like this. here because before I was talking about in the verse, he was starting on the fifth beat, right? And then ending it on the first. Now at this part, it feels like, especially because they've come forward to be with the audience more, it feels like they're really inviting the audience to sing along with them. And they are starting on the downbeat now. So that is a better indication to the audience of where to begin. I'm glad that they didn't really invite the audience as much to sing earlier in the song because catching the 7-4 earlier would have been much more difficult. But now it's, you're getting used to it. It's kind of sunk into your bones a little bit throughout the song, right? It doesn't feel so jarring anymore. It's kind of like, in general, whenever there is change in life, right? It, it feels a bit jarring and you feel a little bit off put by it, right? It, it's, it switches things up. It's unexpected. And I can totally see how, how the 7-4 in particular, I don't know if this is true, but I could see why writing a song in 7-4 would appeal to somebody that made such a big decision to leave Genesis and start a solo career. It makes sense that a 7-4 um, time signature would evolve out of that for your very first solo single. Um, so this uh, this idea of okay, it's something new. It feels different and awkward at first, but as you get used to the change, that becomes the new normal, right? So at this point, the audience is going to be able to actually catch that downbeat each time and sing along. Oh no, I'm bobbing side to side. Contagious. Hey. <laughs> oh. I don't know how you can listen to that and not just be going side to side the whole time because it's very, very infectious. I like the infectious hope that's in it. I really appreciate the clear storytelling quality of Peter's voice. And I particularly dig the 7-4. The 7-4 is so cool. It's such a, it feels like such a critical part of the song and so purposefully done. I think that it was put there to add to that theme of the song of change, of taking a leap at something. Um, though I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Maybe I'm just reading into that a little bit too much. I would love to know your interpretation of this song. So please comment on that below. And if you'd like to hear more cool videos like this, you can check out this playlist right over here. I'll see you somewhere soon.